So our next speaker is Sway Lu from SUNY Albany. The code that you saw, he's going to talk you through. But that defake, uh, that was him and his grad student Lee and our volunteer Barton who did that. And just a short reminder, if you're going to drift in and out of talks, 5 o'clock AI unwind time. We have some really cool kind of hands-on. You can try some of this stuff yourself from 5 to 7 today. Sway? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, all right. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is my first DiveCon, but it's, it has been all, uh, already been very exciting. So uh, we took the full credit of making uh, this movie of uh, Tom Paris, and uh, in doing so, we have seen a lot of videos of. Uh, uh, Tom Perez. My apologies that I can't come to Las Vegas. However, I did want to share with you what we at the DNC are doing to increase awareness. Well, so. I'm just saying um, we have done, we have actually generated several, quite a few videos with uh, different in, uh, reenactment uh, from Bob to Tom Price. Um and this one is actually my personal favorite because the face is not as stern, um, and it's it's, it's, it's it's quite nice. Um, but but this so this so case, what do we mean by defake? You see that here we basically transform the facial expression and um, um, and the move, the facial movement uh, from one person's face in this particular case, Bob's face, to another person's face in this case, Tom Perez. So this is what we call defake, and this is all done by an algorithm. Okay, it's done by an AI algorithm. Now imagine if we have this kind of technology, we can do a lot of things. Some are interesting, some are bad. Um, for instance, we can make Nicolas Cage basically play whatever role he wants to play, be anybody he wants to be. Right? Um, more interestingly, we can make President Obama to sing a song uh, that he may want to sing but never get the chance to sing to us. Right? Or we can make Mark Zuckerberg to say something that he will never tell us. I wish I could keep telling you that our mission in life is connecting people, but it isn't. We just want to predict your future behaviors. Spectre showed me how to manipulate you into sharing intimate data about yourself and all those you love for free. The more you express yourself, the more we own you. <laughs> so. This is the kind of technology that you know when we actually work work uh, on this project uh, make a lot of sleeping nights for me because this is on the one side very very fascinating on the other side also very scary right uh, because we have then the ability to put any words into anybody's mouth at any place under any circumstance right so this is this is what we call generally defect. But as a researcher, as a computer scientist, my interest lies in you know not just feeling this is an interesting technical innovation, but also considering its negative social impact. What can we deal with it, right? So the first thing we actually we actually did we started working on this problem uh, early on uh, uh, February uh, last year uh, when only a few news coverage about this phenomenon started. Um, the first thing we did is actually we implemented our own version of the deepfake software and we keep improving because we want, we, it's our belief that we can only after we understand how this thing is generated can we actually detect an effective defensive measure for that. So let, before I talk about our detection work, let me go through very quickly in a sort of non-technical way how this deepfake works and, and some, some details under the hood. So the deepfake software start with a video of one person. In this case, uh, for instance, uh, the video of Bob. Okay? Um, so it, it's, everything from now on will be automatic, uh, done by the software. Okay? Um, so what it does first is actually run this automatic face detection algorithm uh, to actually locate the face. Once the face is detected, it will be rectified. So it's a technical term just to say we make the face in a sort of normalized orientation. And this is the normal, this is the kind of, rec this kind of rectified faces are the faces that a, a deep neural network can use um, uh, to generate a new face. 
And then all the magic happened within this black box of a deep neural network. Uh, we just call it a deep fake model. And, uh, and, and even within this model, there are actually two uh, corresponding neural networks. One is called the encoder. The other is called decoder. The way to understand this is uh, to make analogy of language translation. Now think about, you have a sentence in English, and you want to translate that English into another language, say Chinese. The way we do the translation is, we understand the, the sentence first, separate the language itself from the message, right? And then we discard the language and reproject the message into another language, in this case Chinese. Right, so the, the message was kept, but the language was discarded, was changed. The same thing happened here for the fake. Uh, you, we trade the faces, the, the identity of the person as the language we talk about. And the facial expressions are the messages we want to keep. So this neural network, this encoder and decoder, just does that. So it, it actually strip off the identity from the faces and leave only the essential ex facial expression into something called the code. That's the thing in between. And the decoder will take the code and interpret it using a different person's identity or different language. Then you get a face of another person but with the same expression. Once that's finished, we reverse the transform uh, that we get the, the extract the original face and put it back into uh, another video, then we get a defect video. So this is a, this is what we call a, this is a synthesized process. But to get the neural network, we need to train it. The way of training is we need a lot of images of both subjects. Okay, um, and. And then we just train, this is called um, uh, self-training, self-regulated training. And the idea is the two person, the, for the two subjects, they're gonna share the same encoder because they want to, the, the encoder wants to extract the uh, essential facial expression uh, regardless of the identity. And then uh, we'll just use the encoder decoder to try to recreate the original face and then measure their differences. After rounds of rounds of the training, we'll get this pair of encoder and decoders, okay? So the two person will, start, will share the same encoder, but each of them will have an individual decoder. Now, the, the most time consuming part of this whole process is training. So what I'm showing you here is a, is a fast forwarded process of training as you see, um, it's that when the face, when we, we got the, the initial neural network, it doesn't have a very good face. But as the training go forward, I'm actually max, uh, 5,000 times maximizing this whole process because on a, even on a very powerful GPU server these days, it will still take about 24 to 36 hours to actually generate a decent model here. But once this model is trained, you're basically done. What, what we do is, go for the, uh, the, the, the synthesized process, provide a video, and then run through the neural network model, generating new faces, and make a new video. Uh, what make this, now this kind of face manipulation technology for images or videos actually exists for many years, as we have seen a lot of movies from Hollywood, like uh, Forrest Gump, we have seen this kind of technologies. But what has been changed with this AI uh, this new technology, new generation of AI, is everything now I'm talking about on this slide can be done completely automatically. So all you need to do as a user is to buy a powerful computer with GPUs, have access to internet, get many images of the person you want to swap, swap faces with, and then you can just let this algorithm run and go do something else, you know, drink a, drink a cup of coffee, you know, m watch a movie. Once the training converges, you come back, harvest the model, and you can start making fake videos. Okay, and can making um, some, some of the, all the, um, those videos I've shown before, most of them, we made them up ourselves. We have probably the most crafted deep fake uh, generation code in the world, um, um, but we don't publicize it because we working mostly on the detection side. We understand the potential negative impact of this, but nevertheless, I think this is quite accessible and everybody potentially can use that, especially the crowd in this room. So uh, this deepfake 
Uh, the state fake phenomenon has caused a lot of uh, me has has got a lot of media coverage ever since the first uh, the, the first was spotted in December 2017 uh, when the first round of uh, fake videos, mostly in the form of pornographic videos, was seen on Reddit. Okay, actually, the term deep fake comes from uh, an anonymous. Uh, um, uh, hiker on Reddit. Even to this day, we don't know his or her real identity, uh, but the account name is called Deepfake. So ever since that name stuck with uh, this line of technology. Okay. So we trying to. So the first curiosity, because I've been working in this area called the digital media forensics for almost 20 years. So the first time I saw this phenomenon, the question I asked myself is, can we actually do something to stop the kind of spread? And uh, reestablish some of the uh, the trust to the online uh, videos medias we have uh, using some of the detection technologies. So we have been doing this. Uh, we, we started. Uh, that's that's all we started. We st we we started uh, getting our own copy of the fake uh, code. We started generating some deep fake videos. And then uh, we try out a bunch of different methods. So the first sort of uh, uh, successful detection method, um, and it also caught a lot of media attention, is a one based on a very simple observation. The first round of deep fake videos do not blink a lot. Okay, this is what um, in in the in Tom's video he talked about. Okay, um, and and the the reason is that the first round of uh, the first generation of deep fake neural network model was trained based on images collected from the internet. So if you want to small face of Tom, Tom Prince, for instance, you go on Google, you do an image search, you get thousands of images of Tom. Uh, but the problem there is those images are mostly official portraits. And when you have portraits photos, you rarely have people close their eyes. Because the photographers will take them down as they're not good photos. And this kind of bias actually is, will sleep through the training of neural network. It's almost like teaching a baby to recognize apples all the time, and then suddenly you show him an orange. And he will have no idea there is a kind of fruit of orange exists there. Okay? Now, this is a simple. Uh, simple observation, and we develop a detection algorithm here. Uh, we actually, uh, whoops, um, actually, uh, does it play? Sorry. So, um, sorry about that. Hope this works. Anyway, all right. So we develop a simple algorithm just using another deep neural network, just looking at the, the, the eyes of the subject. And each time the eye blinks, would the network actually will give us a signal. It turns out that all the deep fake videos we have seen since June 2018, uh, 2018 does not have these characteristics. But there are two messages we we'll learn from this experience. Number one, the other side of gener uh, synthesis, uh, people from the fake video synthesis learn very quickly about this. Ever since we put up a paper on archive, we start to get videos and, and emails from hackers telling us they can actually synthesize blinking eyes. And it's actually not that hard because you can just, because the, the problem is based on the bias of training data, you can simply fix this by inserting images with closed eyes or just train uh, the neural network with videos. Okay? Uh, but we also get another important insight here. That is, those fake videos are detectable. It is possible to look for those Achilles heels of those generation uh, the, gen the deep fake video generation process to understand how to detect them. And, we, and that's what we did subsequently. We want to look for something that's more fundamental, harder to reward, and more intrinsic to the generation pipeline. So um, the first thing we look for, again, is revisit, because we have this code, we revisit the whole synthesis pipeline. Um, and we see that one of the biggest 
one of the important steps there is whenever a new face is generated, it needs to be transformed and put it back into the original, uh, into the video to generate a fake one. Okay, and this is because the neural network can only understand face with that standard orientation. While the actual face in the videos or images come from different orientations, different distance to the camera, uh, uh, you know, represented as different sizes of the face. So this needs to be adjusted, and that adjust adjustment actually leave some tractable marks that can be detected using another deep neural network. And this is exactly what we did. Okay, so uh, what we, what we developed a new, another deep neural network that actually only looking for that kind of artifacts from those images. This kind of artifacts actually is visible uh, if the transform is severe. You may see defect videos with over smooth skins or some jagged areas near the, um, um, the, the, boundary of the, the boundary of the face. Those are actually artifacts of this kind of transform. On the other hand, if they do, if they do this more subtly, gently, and do some post-processing to remove those artifacts, it would be not easily noticeable by naked eye, but this algorithm can still pick up that. Another important type of uh, uh, flaws of defects are from geometry, okay? So we know that a real person's face move with the hat, of course, because face is part of the hat. But when we actually make a fake video, the face is actually grafted on top of the hat, okay? And it's actually not, it doesn't move in the same way. And to actually see this better, we use uh, an estimation of the height orientation. So basically, there is a technology in computer vision that we can use to estimate based on a two-dimensional face image where the head is pointing to in the three-dimensional space, okay? I'll cut the story short. We use that technology to estimate the orientation of a face. And then for a real image, because as I mentioned, face move with head, what we should expect is when we estimate that orientation using only the face part or use the whole head, the two directions that pointing the, the, the head is pointing to estimated this way should be fairly consistent. If this is a fake face, on the other hand, when we, whenever we turn around from the camera, the face is, does, is not generated by first do a 3D transform and then project it on the 2D camera plan. It was done only by a 2D transform on the image plan and paste it on the head to make, to, to sort of synthesize this 3D uh, generation process. So when we actually do that estimation of the height orientation, the two directions will have much better, much bigger differences. Okay, now it turns out that this difference is significant enough whenever we have hat that's moving around away from camera, we can use that to detect if this video is a real video or it's a fake video. Okay, so uh, based on this kind, of, um, uh, artif uh, this kind of artifacts or this kind of um, um, uh, problems of the deep fake generation pipeline, we actually developed a new uh, detection algorithm. Sorry, you just need to see. Um, Right, so we actually, de we actually developed a new technology, a new type of detection algorithm. Um, and uh, we actually tried, not, tried on not only deepfake videos we generated, but also deepfake videos we collected online. So we have our own collection of known deepfake videos downloaded from YouTube and anywhere else. Um, and we tried this, and this seemed to work more reliable. And even better, the kind of artifacts I just talked about are more in, uh, um, um, fundamental or intrinsic to the uh, processing uh, production pipeline of defects, and they're much harder to fix. At least we cannot fix them easily by just augmenting our training data set. Okay. Now, everything I have talked about so far is about the video defects. And uh, one of the problem is the audio part is a gap. If we actually replace the original video uh, of uh, uh, Bob's voice in the Tom Priest video with Tom's real voice, then that will actually make it more effective as a measure of disinformation. 
So we actually look into this problem, and it turns out that to improve the quality of your existence on Earth, you got to do the right things. It turns out that audio defects has also made a very fast stride in recent years. So what I have just played is a synthesized audio of uh, podcast host um, Jay Rogan's voice. Um, here, healthy local ingredients, farm fresh ingredients. Is the real? Is his real voice, right? For if you do not pay a lot of attention to it, you probably will not be able to tell which one is real, which one is not, right? So uh, this is also this is something we look forward down the years as one of the other um, uh, important direction to go in terms of detection technology. So uh, I don't have time to go into some of the details, but one of our very recent work presented last month at the conference is targeting this audio defects. We use a special type of statistical features, which turns out to be quite effective uh, for detection. And just using a two-dimensional uh, uh, feature characteristics, uh, uh, features, we can do an effective ca classification between real human voice and the AI synthesized voices. All right. Um, now, even uh, so, so far I've been talking about detecting defects. But as Bob mentioned, even we can do this detection in a timely manner. Even if we can do this in a very reliable way. Still, the damage has caused. Once a deepfake video is put on the internet, uh, the effect is very hard to remove, and fact checking is always lagging behind. So we have to do something more active, I would say more proactive, to stop this whole problem. Um, so this is one of our most recent work on obstructing deepfakes, which means we want to do, we want to make the generation of deepfake videos harder. More time consuming. It, it shouldn't be just a matter of you know, getting a big computer, getting a lot of images, and then throw at the computer, let it run for a couple of hours, you, get those, you can generate those videos. We want this to be slower, we want this to slow down, we want to sabotage the whole process. Okay? So we go back to check this whole production pipeline, and we're trying to figure out if there's a place we can actually do such. Okay? It turns out that one of the key steps of all deepfake generation, including some other types of deepfakes, like again generated images, are all based on the fact that we can use automatic face detection software to get our faces. So when, I, when, I, when we realize this fact, I feel scary because it's almost like we handing all those hackers for free, voluntarily, our data for them to abuse, right? We, upload our images, videos to YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, without knowing that this potentially could be used to make fake videos um, 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 you know, are targeting us. So we want to protect a kind of a level of protection um, and, uh, uh, for the general users for this kind of attack. And the idea here is to sabotage the face detection stuff. And the face detection, uh, the, the, technolo the technology of face detection has been very sophisticated. Taking off your cell phone, pointing to a scene of full of people in a room like this, you'll see all those little white boxes showing up, right? Those are face detection actively working, detecting faces. But those algorithms are algorithms. They do not recognize faces as humans. I we recognize this as a person, this is a, this are eyes, this are nose, this is a mouth. It recognizes faces based on certain patterns in the image signal. And those certain patterns actually can be disturbed and can be uh, can be distorted if we can Im imbibe some kind of invisible pattern noise into the images. And we call those adversary perturbations. The idea is following. We're going to imbibe this kind of noise, which, will, which are generated by an algorithm we recently developed, into the image. Say, you, know, you want to upload your image or video to YouTube, to some social platform. This, if this algorithm is implemented there, it will become another little checkbox under the user agreement where you check it and say, protect my privacy from face it, automatic face detections. Okay? Once you did that, once you do that, this adversary perturbation noise will embed it into that image. 
Now, the, 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 the interesting thing about this is it actually takes on algorithm, but not human viewers. So this noise I did there is very subtle. So when you share your photo with your friends, they still recognize your face, and they won't see a lot of visual artifacts there. But when this image is presented to a face detector, the face detector will have a lot of trouble to look at to, to find the face. Either it will not find the face at all, or it finds some places where it looks like the face, but it's actually not. Now, if we do this, you can imagine a hacker want to, generating, want to generate deep fake, collecting five thousands of images of somebody from Facebook, um, run automatic face detection alg algorithm on that, and all the faces, most of the faces are wrong or missing from the detection, then the only option is actually go back and do this by hand. And I can tell you, cropping out face by hand, which I did a lot for annotation purposes, is really not a fun job of the world, okay? It's tedious, it's boring, and you get pretty much exhausted after 10 minutes of doing that. So by doing this, we want to protect one layer of protection for the consumers, for the users uh, from this kind of attack. So well, here, uh, this, we have a prototype uh, for that, uh, for this, uh, for this algorithm. Uh, let me see if I can play this. Oops. Right, so this is a demo showing that algorithm working. The image on top are the original face detection results. The image in the middle are actually the images with the adversary perturbation. And the very bottom line are the adversary perturbation, but to be able to see that, we actually enhance it by 30 times. Otherwise, you won't even see it. Okay, so, um, and this also works for videos. Um, um, again, so face detection will fail there, all right? Now, I hope in this very short talk, I convince you that, um, well, I think everybody believe, uh, already um, uh, believe there, uh, believe this already. AI algorithms are causing, will cause a lot of problems down the road, um, right in the drive of disinformation, okay? And defects can actually cause damage. Uh, we have talked talk a lot about the political consequences of uh, maliciously made defect videos. But I also have personal experience working with victims of something called the revenge pornography. Uh, that, those are defect videos generated by posting faces of ex-spouse or uh, mostly girlfriend's face onto pornographic video and distributed that, okay? Um, and and the, the, the kind of psychological damage to the victim is just extreme. So I think there is a real danger there and there's a lot of damage this kind of technology can cause. So we should take this problem seriously. Now, from the technical side, we have been working very hard to develop detection techniques to give us tools to detect this kind of fake videos and also hopefully slow down the process of making such fake videos. But I don't believe this problem can only be solved with technology. As this crowd of uh, audience in this room knows, this is a complicated problem. Like any complicated disease, it needs a combined solution. We need a solution from technology, we need a solution from the government, we need responsibility from the social platform, we need more user education and the coverage from the media, and we also need, even from ordinary users' point of view, to be more aware of this problem and be more vigilant whenever we want to retweet an interesting image or video to our friends, right? So with that, um, that ends my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll have time for questions. Okay. So, yeah, if there's any question from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, the question is, can this perturbation um, uh, technology be used in the physical world, right? So like, like in the hardware. Um, it, potentially it can. Uh, you can actually, you know, it's possible to 
print, print out these patterns. We actually thought about this is more like a sci-fi, but you can actually print out some kind of pattern and paste it on your face. Uh, this may actually work, but we never try this. I think it will be difficult because again, on images, you don't have all those distraction factors of lighting condition, you know, face orientation. Um, it, in concept, it's certainly doable because all matters is what are the signals being seen by the face detection, detection algorithms. Uh, I guess the question is, well, there are two parts of the question. The first question is whether we use GAN in this model. Um, the answer is no. We don't use GAN. I mean, GAN is a more catchy word, but the problem is GAN is much harder to use and train. It turns out that this deep fake or detection can be done all by just plain CNN, uh, which is easier to work with. The second question is uh, whether this this, there are countermeasures to the detection. I think that's, that's always, that will be always the case. Um, uh, it's, it's a cat and mouse kind of game. Whenever we get better in detection, the father is getting better, you know, one, once they actually know about this, and it's not hard. I mean, all they need to, because we want to publish our results. When we put our paper on our archive, we publish in conferences, they actually read the paper, if they're technical, technically capable enough, they can implement some countermeasures, right? Um, so this actually is the very kind of nature of this kind of work. There's always um, a, a sort of competition on both sides. But on the other hand, I do have to say that unfortunately, uh, defaulters have got the upper hand in many cases because they are on the side with resources, with support, with incentives. For us, I mean, the only thing we get any recognition is we publish a paper um, and, and even like a couple years ago, this line of research has a lot of trouble getting federal funding uh, because, you know, it's, it's, it, does, it was not deemed as a very important uh, area. Um, but everything has changed so far. DARPA has a media forensic program which we're part of it. Um, so I think people are taking more, especially, you know, people uh, like the audience in this room taking more attention of this problem, I think the situation will change for better. That's a good question. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, how will this cause some false positives when some non-defect related operation was performed on the video, right? Like, like just remove a little artifact, like remove a, um, a skin imperfection, right, uh, digitally. Um, we haven't really tried that, but my belief is it won't cause a huge problem there. Again, because we're looking for that particular kind of um, um, uh, artifacts, and the artifacts we look for a, at a bigger scale, not just at the local region. So it, the other word to say is, if somebody only did fake, only change a part of the face, a small part of the face, this algorithm may not be very effective we, because we look for the whole face, right? Um, um, but, but this is always the case. I mean, this algorithm, that's why I think the solution should not only come from technology because there are cases we misdetect. There are cases we do false positive, we have false positives. So um, uh, it's, it's not perfect, uh, but this is an ongoing battle there, yeah. Go ahead, please. Be able to get 
Are you thinking ways people could attack what you just did? Yes, I, I think definitely. I mean, this, there's, we're starting to, uh, I, uh, let me repeat the question. The question is, we talk about, uh, there is a competition between followers and uh, forensic detectors. Uh, is there a, also similar competition between this perturbation, this obstruction technique with the followers? And the answer is uh, definitely yes. Uh, once they, so this is only for unaware followers, right? So if they do this without knowing the existence of this te technology, then they can do that. Um, but once they know about this, they can certainly do something to remove this kind of advertisory, uh, adversary perturbations. It's, it's actually fragile. So you can do something like a low pass filtering. You can remove that, right? So, so we are just raising the bar here. We're not trying to eliminate this, uh, uh, the uh, making of fake videos because I think that's not possible. Once it's like a Pandora's box, once it's opened, there's no way we can come back. Um, but on the other hand, we do want to raise the bar so that it will not be as easy as somebody, you know, just. Just, just run the software on the computer. One more question. I can only have time to take one more question. Go ahead, please. Sorry. So this might be out of kind of scope for this knowledge specifically, but has there been research into, um, because really the problem with the deep fake is the repudiation of the source a lot of times, right? Has there been research done into doing like asymmetric encryption from when the video was taking place um, to, I guess, attribute it to a specific, like, hey, like, it's your, your, this camera took this video or this specific news agency because at the end of the day, um, right. if the deep fakes are made, but we all like we all know that these ones aren't valid, it's all what he said, she said. Right, um, right. Has there been research on that? Because that's kind of solves the cat and mouse game. Right. So, so the question is, uh, we have been what I've been discussed here are mostly what I call passive detection techniques, uh, or you know, protection scheme is also in some sense uh, um, is passive, which means uh, we do not we know only what are fake. We don't know if it's true. Right. Um, to actually guarantee the authenticity of each media, uh, we can do what you suggested, um, and this is actually a very, it's a very active line of research called digital watermark. And most recently, people take advantage of the blockchain technology, proposing the idea that you can actually invite something into an image or video, authenticating the, the, the maker of the video, the, the make and model of the camera, and, and day and time, and all this um, uh, important meta information that can be used for the authentic authenticity. Now, um, this idea has been around for almost like 30 years, uh, ever since you know, DVD becomes a thing, you know, people want to protect copyright, they do this. Um, the problem is, is, is again, um, there's a scale problem. You have, we have to do this for every, ex we, I mean, we can do the, all this with new devices, you know, that, that, that probably is not a problem, but to do, to, to actually add this kind of uh, uh, watermark to all existing devices, that's a huge work, huge amount of work. The other thing is these watermarks are also easy to remove and or embedded in. So it's not a foolproof, um, a bulletproof solution either. Uh, but, but as I mentioned earlier on, I think the solution must be something combined together, right? We have the digital watermark, we have detection technology, we have the obstruction technology, we have the detersion uh, measures, we have legislation, we have media coverage. All this together work for the goal to reduce, to sort of control this problem, right? Thank you, Thank you very much. Yep.